on the child. Mm -hmm. So if the sexual assault on the child, then it is for three three years with fine. Mm -hmm. And if the assault, sexual as assault is an aggrieved sexual ex assault, is for five years. Mm -hmm. There is also this. Uh, yeah, interestingly, mm -hmm. the act has also laid down certain uh, do's and mm -hmm. don'ts for mm -hmm. a police officer mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. it comes to offenses of sexual mm -hmm. abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if uh, the offense has been committed on the child, it's been a sexual harassment mm -hmm. on the child, then it is the offense is for like uh, three three years, mm -hmm. three years with fine. Mm -hmm. And if the child has been used for a pornographic purpose or like mm -hmm. relating to pornography, it's mm -hmm. for five years. Mm -hmm. And if it has been has several attempts, then it's for seven years mm -hmm. with fine. Uh, when it comes to child, it gets a little bit tacky and like, some most of yes. the people they don't know about mm. the ideas and mm -hmm. the do's and don'ts about what to do because mm -hmm. uh, the law is being uh, newly Im implemented mm -hmm. and then it's been a very uh, newly used in our society mm -hmm. so uh, uh, the provision let down by the uh, act for the police officer uh, the sum i can mm. explain sure. share mm -hmm. is like uh, if the kid if the child is been a curl child uh, if the victim is a curl child, mm -hmm. the medical examination has to be conducted by a female doctor mm -hmm. in front of the parents. Mm -hmm. And the, there should be special court pr provision to be provided, mm -hmm. a special court for mm -hmm. the kid. Mm -hmm. And the kid should feel, the environment should be in such a way that the child, it's child friendly. Mm -hmm. And the police uh, officers, they, they don't necessarily have to wear uniform. They can't mm -hmm. wear uniform in front of the kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ask like aggressive questions and all. Mm -hmm. So th this and are it has the been mm -hmm. made mandate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so these are some. The police provision. are aware of this, right? Yes, the they police should be because mm -hmm. they, they, they should. Are, they, they, should. they have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for the benefit of the viewers, if mm -hmm. you can kindly elaborate, what is this child? Who is the child? Who can be? Who falls under this box? So act? Okay. and yes. also the other bit is. Uh, penetrative uh, act that is something very common that amounts mm -hmm. to rape and <coughs> most of the cases that is reported are penetrative mm -hmm. uh, offenses. Mm -hmm. What about the non-penetrative? What are the different kind of non-penetrative acts that can also be reported? Mm -hmm. Showing pornography. Showing pornography. Mm -hmm. Just touching. <coughs> touching her or teasing her mm -hmm. or, or tr mm -hmm. even threatening her mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he'll do something or uh, to, to outrage mm -hmm. her modesty. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one uh, factor. Mm -hmm. And we, yes, regarding the uniforms thing, I'm still mm -hmm. stuck there <laughs> because uh, we came across a case and um, the person concerned uh, told us that um, the, chi the child, the boy, that boy, child, uh, he kept <coughs> running away, mm -hmm. though he really, uh, he was in need of the police intervention. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, not not blaming the police or, or, who, or any stakeholders, but uh, being aware of the act or, or, or certain guidelines mm -hmm. that has the do's and don'ts. It, it's, it's helpful and it's very important uh, for somebody who has been assigned to do that, mm -hmm. to, to, to implement it. Because every time he saw uh, the police with the uniform, mm -hmm. he ran away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For which um, he he continued and he started to commit Many bigger crimes. Many children have mm -hmm. a psychological, psychological and fear of mm -hmm. police uh, or uniform. Uniform. Mm -hmm. With the wearing uniform. uniform and all mm -hmm. that. So and uh, and uh, a confession made by a child that um, the police threatened him that he'll put him in jail. And mm -hmm. But the act says that we cannot detain, detain a child in the police custody. At night. Mm -hmm. at night. Mm -hmm. So these are things that um, uh, a person who has been assigned to do that should know mm -hmm. so that we 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 uh, we can achieve the bigger picture i mean mm -hmm. yeah i think mm -hmm. it being a well, new act there is a lot to be done there's a lot there's mm -hmm. lot what to is done the exactly. definition for child and also the year the, the year for the child the the act uh, says that uh, any person below the age of 18 years mm -hmm. uh, is a child okay mm -hmm. okay and and to remind our viewers mm -hmm. that uh, um, the three of you or two of you are lawyers over here. They are trained and practicing lawyers, mm -hmm. so they know what they are talking about, mm -hmm. and especially the legal mm -hmm. side of it. Mm -hmm. um, what are offenses and punishments then? Again, you have already talked in detail, but mm -hmm. uh, are the offenses and punishment different for adult and child of uh, these offenders? Uh, offenders? Meaning yes. against adult yes. and against child. If the uh, accused the accused is a child 
it comes on it will be covered by juvenile, juvenile justice act yes. children will be covered under the juvenile justice act mm. Mm. so if it is if he is an adult of course the criminal procedure and the crpc and all this ipc will be laid down mm. uh, yes. to punish the culprit mm. children are sent to observation hall mm -hmm. the juvenile mm -hmm. the, the whoever the uh, the mm. abuser is mm -hmm. will be sent to observation home and we don't really call them a sentence as such mm -hmm. but they are kept as for rehabilitation rehabilitation mm. okay. before we we leave <coughs> this very important topic about child sexual abuse is there any important thing you would like to say be educate the society and uh, make sure that you know uh, you educate your child about sex education you cannot you know uh, make sure the society, the world is changing in such a way that you cannot make a child unaware of what is going around him. So in a very mild manner, you have to teach the child that if a person, that's why we go awareness in schools and teach the children about good touches and bad touches. If, he if a person touches you in this way, that way, now that is a bad touch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You should also let your child know that you will be always there for him or her. They should have the confidence in you that even if anybody does anything to them, whether it's the teacher, whether it's in the Sunday school or whether in church or whatever, whatever happened to him everywhere, anywhere, you know, he should come, he or she should be able to be confident enough to come and tell you about the problem, complain to you and you, that you will not judge him. Because many of the time it is made to feel that it is because of the child, something that he did wrong, that's why this has happened to him. Mm -hmm. So you should never make your child feel that way. You should always encourage a child to say that we are always here for you, you can always come and complain. And there is also the child line, mm -hmm. 1098, mm -hmm. where you can, it's a call, toll free number, you can call that number for any child who is in need of care and protection mm -hmm. and they'll take care of every situ any mm -hmm. situation that the child is in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you tell more about that <coughs> line again? We have a uh, child line is 1098. It's a toll free number 24 seven, just like 181 again. Mm -hmm. If you call that number, you can call up for any child. You can see who is, uh, you know, who's lost, who is in need of care and protection. If you are aware of any child who has been abused, who has been sexually abused or any kind of abuse that they're going through, uh, you can report it to 1098. Then they'll take up the case. It will, uh, I'll say it in Nagamis. Abnian Bishi Bak Bachahan Ina Marishe Nakan Bijane Arokiteba Muhan Bachahan Harigin Vipai Ina Nohilevi Tahanke Manula Gore Takine Tahanke Bia Kam Kurabi Jane Bolukunke complain Kurwina Bishitake Abnan one zero nine eight call Kudishikule Tahan Abnian Ke help Kuduo or Utu Bachaki help Kuduo as a society as a member of a society it is your duty that you call up these numbers and help a child in need. Thank you for the very important information and mm. we'll have noted it and we'll have written it down and I'm sure our viewers will take action when they uh, come across any incidences mm -hmm. of child abuse or they see it or experience it. And so we encourage you to write to that, to, to call that number. Mm -hmm. And uh, for today, for right now, thank you so much for talking to us on these topics. We, are, we want to make sure that our people are, are aware of it. Mm -hmm. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for this platform. Saving your chisel to perform one moment in a time.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the brain behind the Northeast Dr. T. Al Trophy and our Honorable Chief Minister, Sri Yuki Rio, to give his speech. Friends, I bring you greetings and best wishes on the occasion of the closing ceremony of the Northeast Dr. T. O. Trophy, and also on the occasion of the onset of the new decade, that is 2020. As we all know, Dr. Tali Mary now was India's first ever captain of the Indian football team at the Olympic Games. In the 1948 Olympic London Games, when he led team India to the arena, he ate his name in the annals of India history. He remains one of the greatest sons of Nagaland, the first Naga doctor and the legendary barefooted football champion who will inspire every generation. He was champion, a nation builder, and an icon who proved that no dream is impossible if one truly desires. I must congratulate each and every organization, all government departments and indi individuals who has made the 2020 edition a grand success. I also extend my appreciation to all the participants and to my esteemed Chief Minister colleagues of the Northeastern States who have sent their teams, all of who have played the championship in an exemplary spirit of sportsmanship. This championship has once again amplified the fertility of the Northeastern States. And I hope that we will continue to build a bond of friendship under a spirit of unity and mutual coexistence so that together we can grow. Most importantly, I want to thank and congratulate the sports lovers, football fans that have come out in thousands to support not just the team, but also the championship as a whole. The success of this event is because of the positive support from all the Northeastern states and the participating teams. Before I conclude, a word for State of Bangalore. Let me assure that sports fertility, government of Nagaland, in collaboration with the Nagaland Olympic Association, government of India, and the Indian Olympic Association, formulating a comprehensive long-term games plan to develop sports in the state. We assure you that in the near future, we hope to not only produce champions, but also host national and international events and championship here in the state of Nagaland. All sections and stakeholders must work together as a cohesive unit. And each 
citizens is a member of Team Nagaland. Let us work together as one. Together we will soar. Thank you for listening and I wish you a pleasant and enjoyable evening. Let the best team win for the glory of the sports. Cook Nellum. It takes a great man to recognize the greatness of another. Without the initiative of our Honorable Chief Minister, we would not be gathered here today to see Northeast history in the making. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the fanfare we have all been waiting for, presenting to you the colors of Nagaland.
Gentlemen, that was the colors of Nagaland. And now for, love, for some more live music, please welcome Mengu and the band.
keyboard on the monitor. The keyboard monitor. Welcome to this discussion on dignity of labor and work culture in Naglen. I am Ningulina Kro. And I am Siti Adla. And now before we start with our discussion, may I ask our participants to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Chinga Tukat. 
I am uh, an employee of the Nagaland PWD, presently attached to the Education Division. I am Okenji Sandam, Editor, North East Herald. I am Hikani Jakalu, Advocate by Profession and uh, Director of YouthNet. I am Kevin Ligise, State Project Director, SSC Training. I am Tushilamu, one of the Associate Pastors of Our Baptist Church, Kohima. I am Kedi Thomas, Deputy Director of Tourism. Hello, I'm Joshua, working with UTNET as a Program Officer. Hello, I'm Esther, working as a Program Assistant, UTNET. Hello, I'm Apun, a student of Baptist College, Beatard. Hello, I am Kedim, sir. Hello, my name is Tel. Dignity of labor and work culture in the Naga society is what we are going to focus on this discussion. Through our discussion, we hope to bring up suggestions, opinions, proactive solutions, and practical guidelines in relation to the topic of dignity of labor as well as the work culture in Nagaland. Through this discussion today, we will not only be addressing the uh, visual media, but we would also want to develop our own resources for our NGOs and also for uh, the print media and all other agencies, which we hope will help in developing a suitable solution to this very struggling issue. So may we encourage all the participants to pitch in your suggestions as well as your observations, recommendations on this topic that you've observed over the years in Nagaland as well as elsewhere. And to start off with, I would like to throw this question to our very good group here today as to, so what is the work culture like now in Naglin? Well, first of all, I understand work culture this way. Uh, it is the understanding that every good work is respectable. And with this understanding, we engage in whatever works we do. Now, Work culture in general in Nagaland, I think, is very poor. A lot remains to be desired, especially among the youth. Um, as we go along, we can give reasons for it, but uh, in direct answer to your question, it's very poor. Just in continuance to that, do you think that uh, we are working enough or not? Or do you think we have a problem of the very issue dignity of labor? We obviously have a problem. We have a lot to do. Uh, it could be in, uh, in the field of education. It could be in the field of the family, the neighborhood, the village, the locality as a whole. In fact, it might concern with the, the culture as a whole, because after all, we describe today as work culture. It is a culture. And therefore, the problem is white, deep. Uh, something needs to be done. Pastor Tushi, has it always been like this? Has the Naga society always been like this? Or what can you give, give us a glimpse into what our society was before modernization set in? Well, before, when we were boys, we had to work from morning till evening. That was starting from our childhood while we were in class one, two, and when we went for uh, university studies also, we get vacations, come back home, and then we continue working in the rice fields, in the jungles, uh, cultivating rice paddy, vegetables, and then carrying 40, 50 kgs of the, uh, rice paddy from our rice fields, walking seven, eight kilometers, you know, we had to work every day for our own sustenance, carrying firewood, carrying water, all kinds of things. We had to depend on our, uh, the works of our own hands. After going away from our parents also, uh, we had to uh, work in that manner. But now we see most young people, uh, you want to have a white colored job and uh, you want to earn very good salary plus you want to have a 
NLG, government vehicle. Otherwise, um, if it is a smaller level kind of job, then most young people don't want to do it. And so, you know, be it a shopkeeper or whatever it may be, a small shop on the roadside, uh, they think that it is not for them. They have to have a big job with an LG and you know big salary. Otherwise, uh, this is not for me. I think young people have that kind of attitude. And so, you know, uh, work culture as of now, compared to what we were before, it is very poor. I uh, don't agree fully with what Brother KV and her pastor friend had said because I had gone to the village recently to not my own village but some other village and I found that by the time I woke up all the villagers had gone to their fields so generally in the rural areas people are still very hard working when you think of um, manual labor but it is in the towns in the cities where most of the literate people live that dignity of labor has lost its sheen. Otherwise, I think Nagas were known as a hard-working race, and still now, those who are working in the fields, they are still very laborious, very hard-working, and it is only those people who had gone to the schools, they are neither here nor there, because they have learned in a wrong way that by the time they have done their schooling, they should not be working in the fields because the very word government servant means sitting and eating job. I mean, which was wrongly uh, put in their minds. So people don't have dignity of labor in the offices. They don't do their work. They want to sit and draw their pay. They don't, it, it is only very few people who do the pen pushing and the file pushing. The rest of the people, they come and play cards, they sit idle, they either meet or they do nothing and then draw their pay at the end of the month, which is a very... So, uh, Mr. Thomas, just to yeah. cut in, are you saying that uh, pride is an issue here among the young people, that they do not want to do the manual labor, or is it just something that society has taught them, that doing manual labor is something that's not to be aimed for or something that's nothing to be proud of. What is your opinion on that? It's not pride in the first uh, thing, but it is a wrong education system that has uh, been ingrained in their uh, mind that, uh, or let's say brainwash, that they should not be working in the field. And I think the first people who were teaching them were telling them, ah, oh, you come for a government job, you don't have to work in the fields and you don't have to sweat and earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. No? Okay. That sort of concept was, uh, you know, fed to them in the beginning. So okay. that is still carrying on. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, with regard to the question that our moderator has just thrown, and also in addition to what uh, Mr. Thomas has said, well, I think um, it is not a kind of a fault finding kind of discussion, but what I feel is that government job in the first place in Nagaland has uh, spoiled the work culture in Nagaland because in the past what uh, the old people, uh, I mean the people of the past in the Naga history have been doing is they've been continuing with barter system and there has not been hardly any use of money or even uh, when money has been introduced, you know, at that time also, you know, when you, in Nagaland what we say is uh, if you're getting something for free, you get it in a large amount and we don't know the business culture, so if you're buying it, you get a very small amount but for free, you, you receive a very huge amount. That is also one thing there as well as uh, just recently we've been saying that uh, government is insisting on no work, no pay, which is very good at the moment because this thing is now uh, coming into the mind of the Naga youth that, oh, unless we work, there, there is no option. Because most of, most of the college students, uh, once they get into the college, they feel that I must do a government job. And I will very much agree with Mr. Thomas that uh, a simply sitting job where you get your salary and then you enjoy it, you don't go to office, you keep your proxies, and it is still a very famous culture in Nagaland. I just yes. uh, come in there. See, uh, the point is clear, and we have come to run about an agreement that mm -hmm. the work culture of our parents, rather of the generation before develop, uh, development started setting in, is not the work culture we are talking of today in our society. So 
do you think that it is a problem that's, that only exists in the urban areas like the metropolitan cities like Kohima, Dimapur, or uh, it, w which way is it going? Can you help me there? Is, is it like that or not? Uh, well, uh, I would like to pick up from what Pastor Toshi had said earlier also. Like uh, the work culture uh, in, in the early days where the people were very hardworking, I think it is missing these days. Uh, and I would like to uh, no, make, give a point here that uh, we usually say the young people are to be blamed. But if you really see, it is also not the education system that is to be blamed completely also. The parents, our parents, they give us big, big dreams, big, big hopes, and it is not bad. But uh, when they give us those big dreams, they also at the same time, they should also you know, give us, uh, make us ready to accept any kind of work that comes our way. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it is a white collar job, a big job, with like Pastor was saying, uh, with an NL10 or something, whether it is that kind of a job or a small kind of job, mm -hmm. uh, I think our parents should you know, encourage their children to pick up any kind of job and encourage their young people that whatever job that they get into, they should do it sincerely. Yes, okay, thank you, uh, Joshua. And I just want to introduce about the, talk a little bit about the Youth Net. It's a youth organization which is run by young professionals. It was basically started by Hekani Jakalu, one of our participants here, who was a young lawyer in Delhi herself and very much well employed and successful there, but she left all of it to come back to Nagaland to help our youths. The sort of issues that YouthNet deal with are basically the right to information, dignity of labor, on employment, and uh, basically dealing with the youth and helping them to get on their feet, to start working on all these things. So um, to Hikani, Hikani, since uh, you've started this, there, there are problems, you've mentioned that before, and uh, they go from the traditional to the cultural to the mindsets to the society, to the government perpetrating that and all that. So um, from your short span working with YouthNet and all, what, what do you think would be a possible solution in terms of the employment issue? Mm -hmm. um, the amazing thing is when we started interacting with many young people, we realized that this present generation is very, very positive. We have hope and we know we are going to change for the better and we're so, going to really move ahead mm -hmm. and that is why that kept us going um, but of course it was also important to first of all before moving ahead trying to assess where we went wrong so this whole blame game ha had to be part of this whole process but we are I think we are beyond that now what we did was we also part of a global campaign called the youth employment summit campaign and YouthNet is the host to that campaign. So what we did, we took one step backward. So instead of trying to start creating jobs, which the government is already doing, even in the private sectors, uh, we thought it is important to first ask young people what they want to do. That was so important. Instead of government and elders deciding what might be good for young people, it was first of all important to understand what young people want, what they want to do. That was so important. So the whole of last year, the whole of last year, the government of Nagaland sponsored this consultation. We went to 11 districts. We sat with young people, with the student leaders, with the youth leaders, sat with them on a couple of issues, uh, natural resources and livelihood, uh, information communication technology. And also we wanted young people to start getting into entrepreneurship. So these were the, some of the uh, thematic areas we touched on. Uh, very interestingly, when we were touching on employment, some of the couple of issues came up uh, you know, in all the districts, and that was infrastructure. When you don't have a good infrastructure, when you don't have good roads, when you don't have good transportation, how do you expect young people to flourish as entrepreneurs? That was one issue. The other thing was electricity, because today we are talking of ICT all the time. Now, apart from Kohima and Dimapur and maybe Mokokchung, which are comparatively urban cities, what about the other districts? I mean, if you're going to be talking about ICT, you don't have electricity. So how are we even going to think about connecting or moving ahead with the rest of the world. Um, political interference in CMCF and PMRY. Those are the only programs. There are so many programs the government has for young people. But these are the funds that is specifically slotted for young people. And there also you have politicians, bureaucrats, lots of interference. We want to stop that. Uh, illegal taxation. So these are the issues that keep on coming up. Um, solution, definitely. Because once we go and see this 
young people, once we go and talk to them, the amount of energy and the amount of positive attitude they have is amazing. And that is what that keeps us going. Policy level, we're also trying to lobby with the government because lots of policy needs to be in place. Young people, in the course of time, it'll come around. It'll take some time. It's a process because things have really gone wrong in the past 10, 15 years. It'll take time to come around, but definitely I think we're on the right track. Hekane, just uh, on your own view, as corruption become a part of the Naga society, more than the Naga society, has it become a part of the youths? You know, um, yes, corruption has part has become a part of the society, especially in Nagaland. It's it's the same. It's likewise everywhere, all over all over the country. But uh, I try to be very selfish. I'm so Nagaland centric, you know. So I try to really try to focus only in 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 my state. Um, I will. I think it would be very wrong to blame the young people for being, uh, you know, thinking on the lines of corruption at this point of time. Like I said earlier, if they are thinking on this, those lines, what has made them become like that? So I think, again, I like to put this question back to the elders. I don't like to play a, bl a, a blame yeah. game here, but I mean, it's about, uh, unless we first, all of us, young people, elders, try to understand ourselves first and our roles in the society then you know if we keep on uh, pointing fingers at each other it's not going to work when you all see the system and how it is and if supposing your elders and all tell you that government job is more secure <coughs> and it's for your security for your family for your own prestige and dignity and all government job is looked up on and all that but say you are more interested in entrepreneur and, and starting a business on your own making it on your own without the government's help would you go ahead with it in spite of all the, you know, all the problems like Hikani just mentioned, electricity problems, infrastructure, and you don't get much aid from society because they're all looking at government jobs. What is your opinion on that? I'll uh, side in, uh, in an instance here. Infrastructure, as Hikani said, is uh, one of the most uh, important things that is going to either take the youth forward or go backward. But of course, that is not going to be the only uh, kind of challenge that we should stay back from there with, with an excuse that we don't have a good infrastructure, infrastructural background because somebody from outside, uh, from illegal immigrants, you know, they can still come out, they, they can still come here and start with nothing. Just a morsel and they can make out a mountain out of a molehill. So that's an example that we have to see. But you know, out here, uh, when we talk about political interference and even kind of uh, subsidies like um, and uh, sponsorship funds like CMCF, PMRO and so on. You know, in CMCF, what the UDNET did uh, was after the consultation in all the 11 districts, we identified about uh, 13 entrepreneurs to be sponsored by the government of Nagaland through Chief Minister Corpus Fund. And we have been able to see that, you know, the youths were really complaining. And this complaint, somewhat I would also agree with, because though we have st sponsored them in the month of May this year, within a few months itself, we're, we are starting to see the results. Some are really doing so well. So, you know, such is an encouragement. So the government sh is, uh, should not uh, kind of feel that unless we sponsor them with huge amount, the youths are not going to be doing anything and they are useless. With a small sponsorship, even if the in infrastructure is not that good, the youths are coming up. And I think this is a very good instance uh, where uh, we can see that the next step is going to be uh, brighter with a uh, little more assistance again from the side of the government. Not on a huge level, but uh, small. Just, uh, just the... Uh, yeah. Saying from the perspective of the youth net, it's good that we are getting good response like that. But if you see generally, PMRY funds, CM's Corpus Fund, people treat it as subsidy and they do not pay back the loans that you are supposed to pay back. I'm speaking in general. Now, what is wrong? Is it the system or is it the youths? Well, uh, Newly, I think uh, that's a very good question. And that is because of political interference and uh, other influence from the senior level. Because, you know, when the political parties are backing an individual to get such a fund, that person starts thinking that I have voted for him or her, and he or she has a responsibility towards me, and I don't need to pay back. Such kind of mentality comes. But when the youth are the middle person here, you know that the YouthNet is a non-profit organization, or any other NGOs, uh, not just trying to give the name to YouthNet uh, ourselves, but, you know, uh, when the youths are the middle person here, the youths again uh, who are the beneficiaries, they start having a kind of, the, they develop a conscious, uh, the consciousness to feel that, oh, we have been able to get this not through the political help or other influence, but through the platform which has been run by youth like us. So am I clear in understanding that uh, if it is provided through the proper channel with the right formalities in place, that there's yes. going to be a change? You because are very as of right. now, if you speak to managers, bank managers, and financial institutions, the recovery of 
loans in Nagaland is really, really poor. It almost comes down to 1 or 2 percent, which is not, I can't even say negligible, but they are unwilling to give any loans to young entrepreneurs who are coming up. So in order to change the mindset, that is to instill dignity of labor in people's minds, as well as to change their mindset that uh, in order to have the right work ethics, they need to pay back the loan that they've been given, or they need to be responsible to their society, to their economy, to the coming generation, in terms of supporting people, supporting themselves, and supporting the elderly and all that. What do you think would be the solution in terms of changing mindset? The government, government is everywhere the same. Because you need a pressure group to, to guide the government also. Because the government itself is not going to solve this problem. They okay. have. And we need a political will also. Like we need a person who has the political will to bring a change in society. Okay then, Mr. Thomas, like, uh, uh, is it just the political will and is it just uh, organizations? Anything else that can change the mindset of the people? Actually, it's a very holistic approach, no? Because like uh, political will without people supporting it or say without sh people showing by example, you live by uh, role models as somebody rightly pointed out. So like I think each one of us have a responsibility to the society to start uh, doing some work, be it um, manual labor or maybe even in the offices, we have to be uh, inculcating work ethics. The amount of work that we put in, we should uh, be paid according to that. Mm. I just cite an example. Many of us have servants, and we don't even work in our kitchens, and we don't. Uh, we employ laborers to do even small work. In other countries, uh, from what I have seen also and experience also, we have to carry our own workload we have to carry they don't employ laborers to carry their loads and also they don't keep servants so i think we have to inculcate this spirit in our society so that work culture is uh, imbibed from childhood because our children grow up thinking that it is the way of life and they don't really put labor into it we are only concentrating on a few fields maybe uh, we are talking of uh, agriculture, but we have not uh, even diversified into horticulture or medicinal plants. There are a whole lot of things where Nagas can get self-employment and bring dignity to ourselves. Yes. But we are not doing that. So basically to show by example to yeah, the younger example, generation. Exemplary uh, okay. way of living. And what about uh, Mr. KV? What is your take on this? There has to be a two-pronged you know, solution to this. Uh, one is the, as you have said, the attitude, the mindset. The other is giving the opportunity. The two has to be available because one without the other will not succeed. Now, we had earlier talked a little bit about government jobs. Now, government jobs is good, but is only very, very limited. And so my advice would be don't put too much hope on it because uh, as the NPSC example will show us, for about 100 posts, there are 10,000 applicants. And this will only grow worse. And therefore, our real hope lies in the other sectors. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that so many youth organizations, many of you are, who are representing them today are here. And therefore, I think it's important that we keep on, so one way or the other, with the new innovations, uh, developing this work, et work ethics and providing opportunities as well. Uh, for example, I just want to mention this because uh, when we say promoting the, the, the work ethics, I'm happy to inform you today that in the education department, they have decided to make life skills a full-fledged subject. I think that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting now, we hope that life skills will become a full, uh, it'll be a, a good platform to uh, sort of promote these ethics. Coming to the opportunities, uh, for example, there are certain opportunities but which are not so relevant or practical. There are others which are very relevant and practical. For example, I always talk about um, hair cutting. With an investment of a, maybe a few hundred rupees, because a scissor and a comb is enough, your earning is so good. 
Why not promote these opportunities? But there is one question and there is an observance that many people from our state and from outside, elders and so many uh, technocrats, dignitaries, so many people, social workers have pointed out. Nagas lake consistency. Can you agree with me on that, Hekani? There are haircutting saloons started under the CM's Corpus Fund. They started doing so well, their charges were reasonable, but within two years, they are no more. Now, if you go back to cut your hand at saloon, it is probably a chemist shop and a bakery which seems to be flourishing in our state now. What do you have to say there? Uh, with regards to consistency, there's nothing wrong in not being consistent. Seriously, actually, because when you look at the West, you know, people are doing, they're changing jobs like crazy, right? At the age of 50, they go back to school, you know? So I think it's nothing wrong. Uh, as long as um, the important thing is, if they're doing a job and they're not happy with it and they want to do something else, I mean, that's really nothing wrong. So I think uh, that, is, that should not be an excuse. Of course, yes. But uh, we have to also understand if his job or her job is not doing well, and this is business, he has to make profit. And if he's not doing well, he might as well look for something else. You know, but I want to make a point on the loan thing because that is very, very important. At this point of time, many people, because of the system, we still have to de depend on the government for so many things. Because if the private sectors were in Nagaland, then young people would really not look for the government for help or assistance. But at this point of time, we all know that's not, a, that's not the point. So everyone is looking at the government. Now with, with the issue of loans, um, we have to understand that government is only a facilitator. Mm. Right? They make programs, they're concerned about young people and they're concerned about unemployment. So they're going to be you know, making different programs. But again, government is only a facilitator. Uh, if you would see any government, just, not just in India, but around the world, international also, whenever government make program, you have to have a cell which is monitoring and evaluating. And most of the, th most of the time, these are done by third party, which is not necessarily part of the government. In case of Nagaland, this does not happen. You can't expect the government to go and check whether the young people are doing well or not. You know, you have different roles. It's the role of the NGOs. And NGOs here in Nagaland, it's totally a different way. You have just spoiled the definition of NGOs. Any young people or any group who are jobless and they don't know what to do, then they form a society. And there are around 40,000 odd society registered, <coughs> doing nothing. But in a strict sense, good NGOs support the government. They are the watchdog, as well as assisting the government with research work, monitoring, evaluating, and that is how it works together, hand in hand. Correct. That is lacking in Nagaland. See, I would like to, you know, pro progress with the discussion more on a debatable note. I would like to request all of you to come in with your views, both uh, pro and con, so that we are able to, you know, uh, bring about a mindset change if possible, or, you know, just to broaden our thoughts on dignity of labor, and especially the work culture in Nagaland. Uh, what do you think? Is it okay for us to continue as we are continuing now, or should there be a drastic change in whatever we are doing now? I think we need to have a very, very drastic change. Uh, like we were discussing about the government loans and all. But we must also remember that uh, the government provides that loan to a few hundreds, and the applicants are in terms of tens of thousands. And what do we do with the remaining tens of thousands of uh, those people who do not even avail this uh, government loan. Because these are the people uh, that I think uh, makes us to you know, discuss the dignity of labor and to discuss the work culture. And coming back to the work culture that uh, uh, our, one of our colleagues has pointed out about giving opportunity to young people. I think uh, the one who gives the opportunity to the young people should also understand the work culture. Because see, uh, many of our people in our state uh, they make a lot of money, and to get that, a lot of money, they spend a very, very less amount of money, right? So what they do is, uh, earlier also we were discussing about negotiating the prices for you know, uh, employing the local laborers and all like that, but the people who has to provide the you know, opportunity to, to our people will also, should also understand that they, instead of making too much excess profit, they should also like, uh, have the generosity to pay these laborers according to what they have done, how much they have done. So if we can understand that uh, the employer 
and the employees, if they can understand one another, the employee should also understand that I get paid according to how much I have worked. The employer also understands that I have to pay him or her according to how much he or she has done. There is a labor law which states exactly that. It's just that it's not being enforced in our state for now. Because our economy is so inconsistent and dependent on the government, it is very difficult for that to be enforced. Yet there is a beginning. Before I go over to Tia, I'd like to go to Pastor Tushi once. Uh, in our state, coming down, from your perspective, what are the opportunities that you see in getting oneself employed? And also, uh, the work culture that you have to start with. What is the right angle of you know, looking at a job or uh, at a particular uh, venture? Uh, let me first uh, quote that saying, give a fish to a hungry man. He will eat it, and then he will go hungry again. Teach how to fish to a hungry man, and he will survive. Mm -hmm. And coming back to the solutions, we are up there on the tree in the branches, but solution is down there uh, at the stump the or the roots. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I feel that we have been talking a lot about uh, what the government should do for young people and what NGOs should do and what young people should do and so on and so forth. But unless these young people are taught about work culture, dignity of labor, then um, they will continue to be corrupt. Uh, they will get all kinds of loans but they will misuse it. And so just like uh, that saying, charity begins at home, work culture must also begin at home. And uh, I feel that we as parents, uh, we have spoiled our children up to a great extent. You see, um, I have three children and none of them know how to make tea, a cup of tea, because we haven't taught. We have Minis and Kanchas uh, all these years and uh, they do everything for our children and so they don't learn anything and me being a pastor I'm able to keep a mini and you know help my children like that but those big shots in uh, government officers and so on rich people they are able to keep uh, three four five mini Kanchas at home and so their children are not taught to do anything so is there, is there a relation between this mini kancha and dignity of labor, something to do with the work culture? What I mean is, since these mini kanchas do everything for our children, our children do not learn anything to do at home. And so they grow up, and they grow up with this mindset that uh, they don't have to do all these things there will be others who will do it for them. So, Pastor Toshi, are you saying that you regret it a little bit? I regret it very much. Okay. And um, all of us should regret it. I mean, uh, we elders should regret. You see, and so, bottom line is, um, just like charity begins at home, work culture also should begin at home. And to do that, um, we have three very important, uh, important things here. First, uh, our Naga society is very, very much uh, based in the church, religion. And our religion says uh, God worked for six days. He rested on the seventh day. Even God worked for six days. And then the Bible is full of uh, uh, teachings that if somebody, like for Second Thessalonians, if somebody doesn't work, don't let him eat. And then Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 6 says, uh, go to the end, you lazy person, and learn from it. Become wise, you know. Bible is full of uh, teachings regarding uh, hard work. And then uh, what, I, what I like to say is, the church must start teaching in Sunday school, in ch child evangelism, in the church, the, uh, the meaning of hard work the dignity of labor and the schools schools should also start teaching children about the goodness about the usefulness of hard work the church the family and then the school 
all three of them together, if they start teaching from childhood about dignity of labor, the problems that we are facing now, we would not have been facing this kind of problems. Uh, if it is respectful, if it is good, then we should teach our children to use you know, uh, our hands and feet and mind and mouth uh, to work uh, and feel proud about it. And so from childhood it should start. Yes, thank you Pastor Toshi for highlighting on that really important issue. You've said it publicly yourself that you regret your children cannot make a cup of tea. Very much. Because very much. Uh, I once met a police officer's wife who very proudly said none of her daughters can make tea and her son can fry an egg only. And she was very proud of that fact. So hearing straight from a pastor's yeah. mouth, let's take an example for ourselves. That it's the school, the home, and the society collectively that can change the minds, mindset of the youth, the young people that not knowing work, not knowing how to feed yourself, how to carry yourself around, is nothing to be proud of. So thank you for that. Can I just add one thing here? Please, please. What pastor said about uh, teaching them how to fish is, I think, the point, uh, the, the, the crucial issue. And that's what we should all be aiming for. I also would just like to add another point that is, uh, uh, to say that nothing succeeds like success, you know? That is to say, we should all be trying to make successful examples instead of talking only. And therefore, if the NGOs represented here, uh, as well as all the others, could somehow devote some of their attention to bringing about successful projects as well, that would be a good eye-opener. You see, because people talk about agriculture in Punjab. They said, is not really government programs, though it, is, it helped, but it really is the effort of retired general, uh, retired generals, army generals, who had the time and money to invest in agriculture. It was so successful that suddenly Punjab became agriculturally successful. I think these are very good uh, examples, and therefore uh, good examples is, I think, another very important solution. We need very good leaders. That is very, very important for us to acknowledge on that very point. I'd like to go to Joshua once. Uh, coming down back to, uh, to the ground reality, what are some of the opportunities that you see before we you know, start talking about work culture in them? What are some of the opportunities that you just look around besides a government job? Besides the government job, uh, to talk about opportunities in Nagaland, you know, it's a little complicated question also. But uh, of course, you know, for a very hardworking person, I think uh, there is no dirt of opportunities. A person who is really willing to work hard, it is not just the government uh, that offers the opportunities. And even if I cannot mention the details of what we have to do and what we don't have to, you know, from a laborer's job to the highest level, it is the very hard working person uh, has an opportunity. And I think uh, I don't have to explain the details because people really know it. The youths know that if they really are willing to sweat and work hard, you know, there is an opportunity. But because they don't want to sweat, they're not doing it. So I think that's just a simple answer. Uh, just well, let me question on that sweat thing. Mm -hmm. uh, are they not willing to work hard or is it the pride factor that comes in again or what is it? I'd like you to, you know, just tell me, is it, I think it could be something with the ego also. Well, well uh, when it comes to ego, I think that is very true because a person, once the person crosses class 10 level, you know, they started feeling shy to even uh, carrying their own handbags and small bags and so on, you know, that things come in. But, uh, you know, there, there's one thing, one point I really want to add because I feel that the government should not become a fish market. The government job should not become a fish market. You know, uh, even class one jobs, I'm very surprised to learn that uh, more than uh, 800 pay scale kind of jobs are being very easily given away. And as long as this free kind of uh, uh, trading system, you know, things are hardly going to change. And the other factor is also that, um, though it is a little, it's a kind of complicated thing that we find it very hard to mention, but as long as the factional ri rivalry is uh, prevailing in our state, you know, the change will hardly come. And as a Naga, you would born as a Naga by blood and by everything a Naga. I feel very sad that factional, factional rivalry is always a very common issue. And with this, most of the high school dropouts, they find it as the easiest target uh, to be a part of these uh, anti-social elements, uh, especially uh, spoiling the good image of our you know, kind of uh, movement and so on. And this is also one very, very major issue if we can Delve See, into coming it. on that very, very sensitive point in which we practic practically have nothing to change off except keep up hope to keep on going that one day peace will prevail in Nagaland. I have a feeling that we as uh, NGOs or government agencies, whoever, 
at a society, every one of us, we have to start thinking seriously about below high school, I mean, high school dropouts also, because most of our programs are based on college dropouts or above class 10. We have to seriously start thinking about below class 10, because most of these very unreasonable antisocial elements are below class 10, high school dropouts. And this is a very serious problem. At, uh, so what you're trying to say is that if they are educated, this problem is not going to come in? Or how uh, educated in a, in a sense, like it's not that we have to start giving them uh, opportunity to study more, nothing of the sort. But we have to try to see that some rehabilitation program, which I do not exactly have it in mind right now to uh, blur it out. But then, you know, it's I want to offer some solutions. Our forefathers, he said, that when, uh, if you sweat it, you can earn a living. Our forefathers were sweating it out day and day out, but they could hardly subsist on subsistence agriculture. So now with uh, all the resources and all the education that we have, we have to take a scientific approach, a systematic approach, and maybe use all the machinery and all the equipment that we have at our hands to make things easier and maybe that will offer opportunities for more job creation and also bring solutions to some of our problems because uh, cheap labor is not easily available and that's why among our Naga people, that's why you can see outside forces can come and they offer themselves as cheap labor and uh, that way Nagas in turn become unemployed we are talking about migrant workers again, who are willing to do any kind of manual job that is thrown to them. Yeah. And they are making a living out of it. Why can't our people make a living out of it? Can you just, you know, elaborate on that? Right. You know, the construction department, that is uh, our, you know, our state, we are doing a lot of, you know, uh, development in, you know, infrastructural developments. And if you see, uh, you, uh, I mean, you will notice that uh, all these workers, if not all, at least 99% of these workers are from outside of our state. And most of our engineers, you know, degree holders and uh, diploma holders are, you know, staying uh, jobless, unemployed after complete, completing their studies. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, the employers, instead of employing people from outside, why don't they give the opportunity to our people? Because if uh, you will notice that some of these people who are, you know, who we call as mysteries, head mysteries and all, some of them are, you know, degree wala, some of them are diplomas also. I mean, those who come from outside of our state. So our own people can also, you know, take up this kind of a job. And these are, you know, uh, good paying jobs also, even, even if they are laborers also. Uh, in our village, uh, if a person, you know, uh, cultivates, the amount that he earns in a year will be not even half of the you know, earning of a construction worker. And you will find that so many construction workers are from outside of our state. And if one of our own Naga brother or sister can get inside that, you know, construction company as a, maybe as a mystery or as a head mystery, he or she can contact some of the, you know, uh, high school dropouts or some of the, you know, uh, young people who are just staying idle, you know, and then getting involved in, you know, anti-social uh, activities. activities. Uh, he can, he or she can cut them, and then you know they can find employment here. Hot leg kicking, and the bamboo pushing game, which is a test of the physical strength. And of course, we ended the evening with the war cry, where the participants had to yodel. Today, we will be moving on to Mezoma village. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm uh, Samiran. I'm from Guwahati. Uh, it's a good experience. Uh, I'm not here exactly for a competition purpose. More than that, it's a chance to explore the interiors of Nagaland. Okay. And learn the culture. much pain and troubles to reach our home, our village. So once again, thank you all. Here, each one of them. And from tomorrow, as they move further from here, you will continue to be with them. Your mercy, your mercy journey will be with them. We invoke your blessing to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Target the matchbox the most will be counted. Hit two hit. Thank you. One target. Oh. 
you are done you have to say up before you slide down <laughs> Any Naga village, children play in the morning and early morning it is. And today, another beautiful day here at Mezoma. We reach destination Mezoma on day three. And of course, we were given a rousing reception besides the cultural performances and demonstrations. We could also play some of the traditional indigenous games of the people of Mezoma and therefore we will move to destination Benru which is perhaps the last destination of the villages that the Great Hornbill Adventure Trail will cover till we reach the Naga Heritage Village Kisama. Yeah. <laughs> 
धन्यवाद दिए से फर्स्ट सब गोष्टी के आई के नाम उनसा करने हमारे काम गोष्टी विलेज काउंसल और गोष्टी मानो लार नाम पर सब मानो की भी वेलकम प्रेस है कि नाम है तू भी धन्यवाद दिए से हमें आन निजोर नगा मानो बोली भी हमें आन निजोर ना आजकल ही तो हमें आना एनसीसीएस संकी कोड़े हमें आन भी ना जाने हो जाए से कि ना गेम गेम भन जाने थे वो बोली भी खिलौने ना ना जाने इतने हमें आन बोली भी बाहा मानो बोली भी इतने नहारा हो करने इतने घाट तो शुरू कर दिए Number three, followed by competition number eleven, second place, third place. Oh! <laughs> 
The ancient village of Benru was established since time immemorial by the inhabitants of Inkil Wangdi, from where the earliest Jilin people migrated to various regions in the present-day administrative areas of Nagaland, Manipur and Assam. Today's Benru village was re-established in and around 1840 and the village perches high on the Mount Pauna range at an altitude of 2,500 meters. The Great Hornbill Adventure Trail Day 4 reached destination Benru. Benru village declared a tourist destination in the year 2006 has a total population of about 700 people with a small household of 100. The village is clean, the people are hospitable and the view from the village itself is a wonderful sight to behold. And after tonight's rest here at the Benru village, the team will head for the Hornbill Festival at the Naga Heritage Kisama whereby the final results of the Great Hornbill Adventure Trail will be declared by the Commissioner and Secretary, Mr. Himato Zimomi. The Great Hornbill Adventure Trail carries a total cash price of rupees 1 million. <laughs> Second goes to number nine. The third goes to team number eleven. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Great hornbill. <laughs> Champion Gold Team Number Nine. Congratulations, everybody. Well done. Please stay back, all the members. It's okay, relax, relax. Don't, don't push your hand. Come on, come on.